friends! Welcome to episode 240 of Storyteller Conclave. This is a show all about helping you run the best tabletop role-playing game that you can, whether you're a new storyteller or dungeon master learning the craft, or an experienced storyteller looking to take your game to the next level. I'm Sarah. I'm Rob. How we doing, Rob? You know, I'd say surviving. Yeah, surviving seems to be the order of the hour. I almost didn't make it over here. Yeah, yeah. Like, I- I'm glad you're feeling a touch better. Yeah, through through my back out yesterday somehow, like that that like lower back, I think it's a like the sciatic nerve sort of thing, you know, yeah, where like yeah. it hurts to sit. So I had to like take a half day at work. Mm-hmm, I'd mm-hmm. called off to work today too just to and been sitting with a heat pack the entire time. So it's it's new chair time it turns out cause I, I think you should get a new chair. I, I sat in I sat in Sean's chair today and it was it seemed to be working out for me. It was me. nice. Okay. Yeah, it was pretty okay. it was pretty good. Cushy. I think it's a padding and support issue. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm I'm doing I'm doing okay. 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 Here. Okay. Uh, All about, right. about a three out of ten on the discomfort. You know. Okay. You okay. Know. Not bad. I'm gonna die. Okay, that's that's good. That's yeah. good because dying in the chair across from me during a podcast would either really increase our increase our listenership uh, or tank it. I really don't know which way it would yeah. go this day, these day and age. So, yeah. Well, I mean, dude, certainly, certainly, uh, make some waves. I think. Well, it depends on who hears it. Also, do you die like Castle? Uh... Uh no no uh this is this is considered a damage over time effect so oh, it would definitely okay. be like a uh, 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 okay full, uh, uh, full villager you know? got it yeah okay. exactly right okay. well good luck skeleton well thank you <laughs> so uh, you had your game this weekend I did have my game this weekend a big I mean, one too yeah it was the closing of Act Two it's closing of Act Two uh the kind of surprise reveal of the big villain surprise it turned out to be the guy that you guys had adopted into your group mm-hmm. i don't know how many how many of you guys saw it coming uh, i know sean kind of got bamboozled by it i saw it coming i just didn't see it i, I didn't see it un unraveling in that direction mm-hmm. uh, i expected he was going to do something with the gate oh yeah yeah, yeah. which i mean kind of he did kind of he did yeah kind of he did yeah. so it was just one of those situations where i thought either a uh, it was going to happen in the room with the magistrate. Mm-hmm. Like, he would just do something, like, last minute, like, you know, well, if you don't believe me, then I'm going to, yeah, I'll just try this right, right in front of you. And it was a thing that he shouldn't have tried. Mm-hmm. And and a shit hits the fan. You know, something like that. But I, I knew something was going to happen. I just didn't know what. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, and we're, we're actually, we're, we're slotted to talk about some NPCs today, so I'll, I'll, t- I'll actually talk, talk a little bit more in depth about kind of what happened in the game with that yeah. NPC. But uh, basically, Act 2 turned out to be a big slow boil of uh, you guys adopting an NPC into your mm-hmm, group. Mm-hmm. Um and really trying your level best to try to get him get him uh, uh, squared away. He was kind of an exiled member of uh, a big mage family, mm-hmm. um, and uh, he kind of had like a, a final exam coming up of like, are you going to be worth letting back into the into the good graces of the family? Right. Are you know what what have you learned in your time that's worth you, you know magical go, being able to go home? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the leader of the Mages Guild basically had a chip on his shoulder mm-hmm. about this guy and didn't want him there and mm-hmm. was trying to screw with him mm-hmm. and whatnot and basically put him in, in a position. Uh, this last episode here, this last uh, last game session, um, the the tester guy from his uh, the, the magistrate from his uh, from his family came in, mm-hmm. um, and tested him and then just left. Didn't didn't did, give results. Did, he he had brought two like assassins with him. Um, of, as like, these are my attendants, these are my bodyguards, and they're like, yeah, yeah, right it is. Mm -hmm. So he's convinced he was going to get killed, because they're going to clean up loose ends, right? Right. They're not going to allow a, a a low, like, a low talent member of their family to be around, because, like, they're an elite club, you know? Right, right, right. So, you can't, you can't just have somebody not worthy of the name wearing the name, right? Right. Um, but yeah, they, they just left, and he was so incensed, and so... Uh, just just at just the indignity of not even giving him a yes or a no. Mm-hmm. They just leave, mm-hmm. and he was like, "All right, that's it." And he snaps and makes a deal with a very powerful entity to become a god because he will show them what real power is. If he can't get back into the family, he will take over yeah. the world. Yeah. Well, you know, if I can't if, if I can't be in your world, you can't be in mine. Exactly. Yep. And uh, ki- like murders the 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 the, the guild leader. The guild yeah. place is shut down now as an active crime scene. Mm-hmm. Magic cops came in. Yep, it was great. 
It was, it was all it was good pretty, times. It was pretty yeah. amazing. It was pretty. It was very emotional. Yes. You know, stress, concern, well, all kinds of shit. I had I had a player crying at the table. You did. So, you, know, you did. Like not 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 in a bad way. No, no, totally in character. Uh, watching the story. So uh, I feel I feel pretty good about it. You, you made a, you made a PC cry. I made a PC cry. That's correct. Yes, that's the best thing. Making making players cry. Different story. Making PCs cry. Choice. Yes. It's, what? Why do I feel like it's the uh, the scene from the Emperor's New Groove when the PCs cry? These tables just sing. <laughs> <laughs> In any case, we do have a show tonight. We have a two hundred two. Yeah. Um, and we're picking up where we left off in July of 2021. Ugh. So we, we've done, we've talked about NPCs before. Uh, we talked about them in episode, uh, um, 117. Uh, and then we kind of talked about them a bit more in episode 170. Uh, 117 was, uh, regarding NPCs directly, how to make literally this episode lifelike NPCs, mm-hmm. um, where we kind of just deconstructed the process or constructed the process of what we go through. Uh, and then in 170, we were talking about how to make your world lifelike and we added in kind of some elements about how they fit into stories and such. Yeah. Um, so we don't really want to like rehash uh, a lot of a lot of turf here. Um, episode one seventeen from July of twenty twenty one is is a very solid episode where we cover a lot of this stuff in depth. Um, a, a lot of serious basics. I mean, there's a lot to write down in the process, but at the same time, it really is a good building process. Yes. Uh, uh, but but here with this with this two hundred two, what we kind of wanted to do was dive in a little more on a. Um, I suppose you know you, Rob would call this like a workshop. Um, yeah. Where, we wanna we wanna talk about some of the more esoteric ways that we go about building NPCs, mm-hmm. and then we kind of want to go over some examples um, and show you how this process worked in situ mm-hmm. um, for some very successful NPCs. So not not just theoretically, but like describing the circumstances that that NPC needed to be invented, and mm-hmm. then go through the process of what we did to build that NPC into what they became. And we have some really good questions that we'll also be going over that are very specific and we can construct on those as well yeah, uh, and really give you some good examples. So, uh, so we want to, we'll start with a little bit of a little bit of recap here. Um, mm-hmm. so w- when we say a lifelike NPC, what are we talking about? Um, so to me, it's, it's much more than a, like a background character, mm-hmm. you know, this is someone the PCs are going to interact with for more than a brief moment. Um, you don't have to give a full background to like literally everyone. That's, it's way too overwhelming. Okay, so a, a lot of this is we want to focus our efforts very mm-hmm. directly on the PCs and on the NPCs that we are, we know are going to be sticking around, are going to be there for longer than a conversation. Mm-hmm. You know, um, but lifelike meaning that they have a personality beyond shopkeeper mm-hmm. or information dispenser. You know, mm-hmm. uh, a voice, a goal, likes and dislikes, maybe an interesting quirk or a verbal tick, a physical feature, things like that. Something that makes them memorable yeah and and the part that gets me about that is that the thing that often makes things memorable are these are are the little pieces that add imperfections or flaws when i one of the things that i always looked at was when i was uh first starting in digital video games you'd look at something and you knew that it was synthetic that it wasn't a real thing because the terrain was identical or it was almost uh, too well crafted right mm-hmm. it was perfect or near perfect and the imperfections that were in it were linear they they replicated themselves the crack that was in this tile is the same crack that's in that tile right and you could see it was identical the way things literally were tiled uh in the textures now we're starting to get to a place in video games where that crafting of worlds add adds a whole bunch of layered imperfections and it makes it very hard to see the assets that are replicated. Yeah, all like and, the little little clutter in corners, exactly. the, the 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 marks and stuff like that on various, you know, surfaces that that don't don't get replicated. They're 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 unique, you know. Right. And I think in a way that makes it memorable, makes it feel real. Mm-hmm. And so we do the same thing with our NPCs. We give them they give their personality some layer of imperfection or flaw that is unique to them so that it feels like they're a little messed up. Mm-hmm. 
you know, it doesn't have to go to the extent of like their great grandfather, you know, was used to beat them and they were homeless. And yeah, like, well, you, that's not what we're talking. We're talking about literally the simple things that you can see, touch and feel about someone. Right. We're not we're not talking about trauma. We're talking about like maybe a sniffle. Yeah. You know, someone who talks to you like this and they're going to talk to you, you know, telling, giving you the information about the, the thing that they saw the other day, you know, but you're going to remember. Oh, that's a sniffly kid. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember him, that you know. totally filled up my inventory. Yeah. <laughs> you, you're laughing because you know is, exactly who I'm thinking. That is a joke for precisely two people. <laughs> so I love that. But it's a memorable <laughs> character. Yes. And all he is is a shopkeep, but he's a memorable character he's a memorable because... shopkeep because every time he slurps his coffee, you want to punch him. Exactly, because you can't. He's the one guy you can't shoot because you can't even draw a gun in that area. <laughs> but the whole point of it is, is that there are th- aspects, whether it's do they talk too much because they're nervous or... Do they have a crush on somebody? So they're they're every time that person, other person comes through, who may not even be a named NPC, it's someone who works with them that they see, they blush, right? Yeah. Like the baker passes in front of the their shop voice just kind of trails off. As the, I'm sorry, what right. was I? Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, <laughs> or is like every third word a sailor's vocabulary? You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but the whole idea is this: it, it it sounds like we're breathing a lot of imperfections and life into these and that like there has to be a backstory like we're we're coming up with these things like these love stories these aspects mm-hmm. it sounds like a lot <laughs> oh god i have to do that for every single npc no dear god don't please please don't, don't. please don't please it's don't. fine take a deep breath that's not at all what we're saying yeah um this is for basically for coming up with quick attributes for like for for NPCs, so when they come up in your story, you have a few notes on how to improv them. Yeah. That's basically it. Yeah, not everyone is noteworthy, and that's the point. Yes. Most people in real life don't matter. Yeah. Right? Um, they're just going about their lives. So should your NPCs. It's fine. You can, you know, you don't have to come up with deep personalities for everyone you meet. Just like, like you know, if, you're asked, if you stop someone on the street and ask for directions, mm-hmm. like, in, in, I mean, and, and I mean in real life, you know. That person is someone. They're on their way somewhere. They've got a whole life story. But you know what? None of it matters because no. your interaction with them is going to be, yeah, it's down the hall and to the left. And that's perfectly okay. And that's fine. We don't need to know what that person's story is. No. And, and I, I'm going to ask this question because I know what the number is in my head. Mm-hmm. How many notable P- NPCs should be in an adventure? In an episode, when you sit down with your players, how many notable NPCs? What's the max? Per adventure? God, like three or four. You I may mean, have others, but within that specific of, adventure. Of, of people who, like, impact the story? Yeah, that, that they would recognize. I'm thinking three or four. I think that's good. Um, you want You want to have someone kind of on the protagonist side. You want to have someone on the antagonist side. And you probably want to have somebody kind of, you know, maybe in the middle mm-hmm. as a as a support or, or, or you know, something to add uh, flavor into the story or something like that, you know. Yeah. But, like, if you start adding in Game of Thrones or Wheel of Time levels of, you know, character cast, you start really muddying the waters. Mm-hmm. And I, I completely agree with that. I, in my personal opinion, if I'm making a complex campaign mm-hmm. at any given time, I do not want to outnumber the PCs at the table. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because the moment I do, now literally people are going to fall off. Because we can only keep so much in our head at a time, and they've already got to remember everybody at the table. Because mm-hmm. everybody at the table has a different name. Yeah. So that's that, that's a whole set there. 13 is the magic number of things you can remember. Most people say it's a little less than that. It's like 11. But if you can keep up with 11 different things within your circle your tribal memory, mm-hmm. right? So if there's already six people at the table, you best not be putting more than six more names down for them. Yeah. And realistically, you're already at a deficit because there's six people at the table and six characters at the table. Mm-hmm. So that now becomes a challenge, especially if you don't only use character names. Yeah. If you're talking both names, n- now you're you're maxing up people's numbers mm-hmm. right there. So... In my opinion, if you're running a campaign, try not to force more than six noteworthy NPCs on a table of six. If it's less than that, 
cut it down. They shouldn't need to interact with those. Have people fade off. They don't exist. Yeah. That, that, and they should know they're done with that, with that named person when they're done with that named person. You know, and, and I, I think, too, like, this is – we're, we're talking mainly about people who are directly affecting the plot. Right. Like, and I, or I have personal, a lot of, personal attachments. I have a lot of, like, little side NPCs, you know, but – they're they're there to basically make the world feel lived in mm-hmm. um, a lot less than they are there to be major players in the plot. Right. You know? Those are names that the players will grab onto and that you make note of when they do. Yeah. They return because your players ask about them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's it's not you know, you, you can you can you can put a lot of NPCs out there. That's and we're not we're not saying only have six NPCs. Mm-mm. But consequential NPCs, people that they need to worry about and interact with directly that are mm-hmm. affecting your plot, that are that are the movers and shakers, you know, mm-hmm. your villain, the person who hired them for their job, um, the grieving widow of the murder victim, you know, mm-hmm. things like that. These are important people mm-hmm. that, that, that are the NPCs we're talking about. But like filler characters, you can have a lot of those. Mm-hmm. And arguably... I think I'm. I think we're kind of talking about the filler characters today, like in many ways. The f- for me, making the bigger NPCs is actually easier. Yeah, because you've got all this plot, right? Mm-hmm. You've got all these motivations. They're very well thought out. You put, you tie them into your story so much that they, the story makes them live and breathe. Yep. Right. You you've thought about them in the shower. Every time. Exactly. Every commute to work, every more than five minute bathroom break, I'm mm-hmm. thinking about that NPC. But it's it's the little ones, I yeah. think, that, that we really need to kind of focus on here. You know? And oftentimes the, those little ones are the ones that your players will stubbornly reoccur with. Sure. So one of the examples that, uh, that we came up with when we were kind of uh, building up the story was, like, one of your characters, one of your players, kind of brings up the fact that his character is always looking for better gear. Mm-hmm. So uh, nat- naturally, they're going to be going to a blacksmith or, or, or a weaponsmith or an armorsmith of some kind. Yeah. That's going to be something on the regular that you're going to have to think about. Now, you could have dozens, you know, depending on where they're going, but you could also make one that they constantly return to. Mm-hmm. You know, their uh, their own personal loop. And that's where it becomes important that the first time they go there, it is something memorable, making them want to return to it. Yeah. So we step into that, and that's kind of where we're going to come the angle on this, is that we're going to start constructing and destructing at the same time. Mm-hmm. So in a situation like that, the, there's some basic stuff to get a personality out. And I think one of the first things is the name. Mm-hmm. And you think name equals personality, and the answer is it does. As much as you don't think it does, I think it's hilarious when a game throws a name at you and you immediately start thinking about that name. Like, if the fir- if literally one of your players are about to approach someone who is stubbornly picky, and the bar and you're like, "Oh man, I gotta go talk to that woman," you know, and the bartender goes, "Oh, you mean Karen over there?" Mm-hmm. And you're like, "What?" And they're like, "Yeah, Karen Whitaker." Her farm's up on the hill, and you're like, oh, man, it's a Karen. Oh, man. <laughs> of course she's because, a Karen. Because it's already established yeah. that the name, no different than if you if you name the person Jim versus James versus Jimbo. Yeah. Like, those are all different feelings from each one of those yeah, names. Exactly. Jim, someone who's just very plain and down to earth. James has more of an air of, of sophistication about it. And Jimbo, you kind of expect yeah. the guy to be brewing his own moonshine, you know? Well, at the like, same time, like the first time I, I gave you one of my characters, his name was D, just the letter D. Mm-hmm. And his and his monogrammed Warchester. He was D Warchester. And it's like that has a connotation of power on its own. Like, I don't yeah. you don't even get the right to know my name. The man is a monogram. Exactly. <laughs> But this is the start point behind it, and it's it's understanding the formality of that person, how they how they should be presented, mm-hmm. how they present themselves. Um, one of my favorite things is uh, uh, that that I always forget to do is oftentimes uh, 
places are handed down through a family by the same name, right? So if it's like Jacob and sons, right? Oftentimes, all of the sons' names are Jacob, but they all have nicknames. So when you go in, it's like, oh, this is Jacob's, you know, uh, Jacob Smith. Mm -hmm. I'm the weapon Smith. Okay. But you're kind of young. Oh, yeah, my dad owned it. His name was Jacob, too. You can just call me Jay, you know, or mm. Charlie, because that's my nickname. Right, you're like, right, right. wait, your name's Jacob, but you go by Charlie? Yeah, because my other brothers are also named Jacob. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. Like, so, to clear this up for you, that's Butch. That's Frankie. That's exactly. <laughs> like, I got a friend who goes by, who who's, uh, uh, goes by Jay in his family, mm. even though his actual name is Steve. Oh, Jesus. And it's so, so weird, but when you realize that, families are the second the third the fourth you know you you have to have a breakup point there yeah to do it but that creates a connotation of of personality yeah sure absolutely like i'm one of many but i'm still unique and honestly i think nick nicknames is another great way you mm -hmm. know i mean someone someone walks up to you like uh uh otakon from uh from the metal gear solid series yeah like, okay it's a great one you know yeah i'm call me otakon like Otacon, did your mom not like you or something? Like, yeah, like exactly. No, my name is my name is 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 oh God, what was it? Like Carl Emmerich or something like that. But yeah, you know. But ot otaku convention. Like, I'm a nerd. I'm an anime nerd. People call me Otacon. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, I get you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. You know. So coming up with like a nickname for your character or mm -hmm. for for your NPCs instead is is a great way to convey a lot of that personality in in a name. Just yeah. Immediately right yeah. there. What what was the name of the main character in Top Gun? Maverick. What is his actual name? Uh, Mitch, Pete Mitchell. But Maverick is the first name you think of. Yes. Which also defines him yes. as a character. Yes. And that's that's the point that we're kind of putting across here mm -hmm. is that, you know, <laughs> as, as funny as it is, Austin Powers had <laughs> the names in that movie were funny. Yeah. But you also knew what you were stepping into. Mm -hmm. No different than where it came from, which was early James Bond. Jaws yeah. wasn't just a catchy name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can do this. And it's your players will appreciate it because it's catchy and it's memorable. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the the other kind of double edged sword that you run into, though, with with names, um, mm -hmm. because you can you can convey a lot of like culture and stuff of like that cultural significance through a name as well. Um, so, like in my game, I'm playing. You're we're playing the Elder Scrolls universe. Uh, so if I say that this character's name is Kazika, mm -hmm. you probably know that that's a Khajiit because that's a very Khajiit sounding name. You yeah. know? Um Whereas if I say a character's name is Hassan Al Sharif, you pretty much guarantee that person's a Red Guard. Probably, yeah. Um, you know, so you can convey a lot of a lot of uh, of, of culture and stuff of like that just through their name that way as well. But keep in mind, this is a double edged sword. Yeah, because Jim Bob is easy to remember, but Hassan Al Sharif is is less easy to remember, and Kazika is less easy to remember than that because no. it is straying so far from what we're used to. Hashtag. Depends on the culture. Depends on the culture, yes. You know, obviously, if I'm sitting in France, Jim Bob is going to be funny. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Marketably funnier than, you know, uh, any, uh, you know, uh, you know, a vein mm -hmm. or something like that, you know. But the point of it is, is that it fits within the framework of reference. And that's all we're saying here is with, with within the U.S. frame of reference, which arguably is quite mixed. Yes. You know, yes. understand that you may culturally want to set something that's easy to remember for those memorable PCs mm -hmm. um, and or give it a reference point. Like, uh, like nicknames help with that. Strider is a great nickname. Yeah. You know? Yeah. For a ranger who's never around. <laughs> <laughs> or hard to find. Um, and inevitably... The hardest part is writing it down because your players are going to have to remember it in some physical format because they're not going to be there all the time. Great place to drop NPC cards. Yes. Have just a face, a name, and a short description on them and just put them on the table so that people can associate a name with a face with the character. Yeah. And it, and it helps ingrain it. In yeah. Memory. Especially if they're in the scene, drop yeah. the card. Yes. Because now they see them in the scene and they remember them. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that was a huge help to me when you did that in your uh, in your game, and yeah. I've been doing it in mine. So. Car carrying that over is one of the greatest things ever. Absolutely. So, let's uh, get into some quirks. 
Yeah. So this is this is the little stuff, and this mm-hmm. is I think the thing that I like the most about coming up with NPCs mm-hmm. is not even big things like what is their profession, what is their life goal. Mm-hmm. I know we talked a lot about that in one seventeen, where we were like, you know, give them a goal, give them a plan, you know, mm-hmm. something they want, and it's very important. Don't get me wrong, mm-hmm. but. That helps you understand the motivations of an NPC, and it helps you move them like a game piece around your plot. Mm -hmm. And it does make them lifelike, but it's not the stuff to me that really, really brings them to life. It's the quirks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Little physical quirks. Snapping your fingers constantly. You know, sideways tilt to their head when they think chewing gum like i said earlier that you know the kid who sniffles between every other word you know little things like that is what brings those these these characters to life i i uh, for physical quirks you can go to other extremes as well as long as they as long as it fits within the piece for instance i love the physical quirk of furiosa she's got a stump and a robotic hand yeah it's it's something that's obvious. Mm-hmm. It doesn't hinder her in any way. It doesn't stop the situation. That's just who she is. Like, there's a story to be told there, and it isn't told. It doesn't need to be. doesn't need to be. Right. The fact that she's missing her arm and it just does not slow her down is, is not all the story you need. Not a tick. And, and there is nothing to say that you can't stretch your legs with some of this. Mm-hmm. Right? You don't have to go to... The typical stuttering and things. Physical quirks can be very obvious. Um, one of the characters that uh, I played in Boulder's Gate, actually BG3, um, I made sure that he had a giant birthmark across his face. Vitilago. Yep. Yeah. Because, and that's something that is easy to recognize. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, no story has to be told about that, but it shows that there is depth there. Yeah. Um, verbal quirks are a big thing. Uh, but think about them more in contextual quirks um, using uh, I'm trying to think of the, the term for it. Um, when you add things to a sentence like I'm notorious for using the word. So mm-hmm. Vicky catches me doing it all the time. Like I'll end things oh. with a question. I'll be like, so that's that's not the one I would have picked for you. Would you pick for me? You ready? Go ahead. No, that's it. You ready? <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. I agree. 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 <laughs> but uh, yeah. So it, see, I'm doing it again. I'm doing the so. Uh, it's something that you can throw into a character. Sometimes it's really hard to remember to do it, so it's good to keep it simple. Um, and I I like verbal ticks that are super easy to add exactly now i think that the thing between like the physical quirks and the in the verbal uh verbal cues are um i think probably the two biggest uh, best pieces of advices for for new storytellers especially um because i see this pretty frequently in the various like subreddits and stuff that that i look at uh mm-hmm. d- dedicated to like D and 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 rpgs in general mm-hmm. is new storytellers going I'm not good at doing voices. Don't have to. So how do I make my NPCs sound distinct from one another? And like verbal quirks is a great way of doing that. You know, mm-hmm. it, you don't, it's not really doing a voice. If you just kind of, you know, say, you know, all the time, you know, mm-hmm. if, uh, you know, you're, uh, you know, uh, doing this and maybe, maybe snapping your fingers, you know, while you're talking, you know, yeah. suddenly this NPC has a lot of, a lot of energy to them. Yeah. And, and you're not really doing a voice, you know? You're just, you know, saying, you know, a lot. And uh, likewise, even great, even some of the greatest actors mm-hmm. don't change their voice. Yeah. They just change a light mannerism about their voice. And even that might be very, very mild. Um, I'm thinking of David Tennant's character in Harry Potter. He didn't change himself he just made himself feel manic and when he was done saying stuff he would lick his lips crazily mm, yeah and that was just enough like yes. that made you feel kind of creepy listening to it yeah even he didn't he, he had to be in the space but it was enough to set it in motion mm-hmm. you know and push you into the feeling of that character a little bit more mm-hmm. and again sitting at a table or, or even across online like that's enough to make you make them remember that character. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, changing just even the pitch of your voice a little bit too. 
mm-hmm. uh, is 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 a good way of kind of differentiating an NPC. Like, um, uh, my last game here, uh, I had uh, Magister Malar Talvani, um, and uh, uh, Hierarchan as Nolanir mm-hmm. um, were talking to each other. Now they're both elves. Mm-hmm. One's a high elf, and one, the the uh, the Mag- Magister Talvani was a dark elf, and the uh, the Hierarchanist is a high elf. But in Elder Scrolls, all elves are British, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you got two male British accented characters talking in the same scene. How do you differentiate them? Mm-hmm. Well, you see, Nolinia talks like this, right? At about this register right here. Whereas Mela would talk a little bit slower and a little bit lower as well. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of just syruping up my voice a little bit, you know? And and one of the things that I'm watching you do in it is almost another cork, which is where you you almost talk with a part of your mouth closed off. Yeah. Like sometimes people will say, try and talk while chew while keeping your cheek bit lightly. What, I, what I'm doing is I'm swelling my tongue up inside of my mouth. Yeah. Um, you know, like like I'm giving the raspberries to somebody. Yeah. You know? And and so it, it kind of takes up a little more room in my mouth, and I'm, it, yeah. but it, and that just changes how the words come out. Yep. Suddenly he's a completely different NPC, and you can you you kind of get that affectation from him. Yeah. Simple things you can do in that are also like the the peanut butter ch- con, you know context mm-hmm. where you act as if you're trying to lick peanut butter off the roof of your mouth while communicating. Hmm. You know it it causes you to to talk. A little fun, just, I'll get to it. Yeah. (laughs) You know, and it's that pause within the break because you're doing something else. Yeah. Uh, I was listening to a guy who was uh, talking about uh, comms traffic in video games. Mm. That it's, it's too casual. And the reason he said is like, I've dealt with comms traffic all my life. I was in the military. When you're talking to somebody on comms, you're doing stuff. So there's a natural pause because your brain is pushing buttons, flipping things, driving, you know, trying to keep track of a dozen other things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But you're, you've done it so many times that you're casual. You're almost lazy to the point of I'm tired doing this today again for the hundredth time. Yeah. And yeah. that tone is hard to get across unless you're physically doing it. Mm-hmm. So it understand that sometimes you need to trick yourself to get to the tone you want and that's where the cards come in for yourself yeah if like you were saying like act like your tongue's a little little full like maybe it's lazy Mm -hmm. and suddenly you have a totally different voice just lazy tongue yeah you know and things like that will come naturally Mm -hmm. will stick out naturally within it um physical attributes we kind of went over a little bit uh, but it doesn't mean that they can't have things that you can describe, like scars, burn marks, uh, exceptionally long hair. Tattoos, yeah. weird color eyes, heterochromia, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, I think that also blends into clothing, because sometimes people will have things that they're masking all the time. Oh, sure. People wearing you know cravats and things like that, where they don't want, where they, they want to be dressed up to their neck at all times, you know? Right, or, right. Because they're covering tattoos that were a previous life of theirs. Mm-hmm. And when it creeps, they, they're, they're always pulling things up to make sure no one sees them, you yep. know? Kind of a thing. Not that it really matters to anybody, but it matters to them. They got bodies, body dysmorphia issues, and they're wearing the dysphoria hoodie, you know? Very true. Yes. Very true. Um, um, or crests, shields, monograms are all great things to have floating around to help extend them beyond themselves. Yes. When you're stepping into an area and you see two guards with, a mono- with monograms on their uniforms, mm-hmm. you're like, oh, this is D's, guys. He's here somewhere. Yeah. You yeah. know. Okay. And and that's the difference is that you can you can push the boundaries of the space of the person when you present more colors. Spectrums uh, are another thing where sometimes guards will look a certain way, mm-hmm. or dress a certain way around that person. Um, uh, another one was uh, bells. 
Uh, if you've ever been to a festival or a ren fair, uh, leg bells are a thing that a lot of dancers will wear. But it also makes them, you can you know that they're over there dancing because you can hear them from 200 paces. Yeah. And you yeah. know it's them based upon the specific bells they're wearing. And the great thing is that acts kind of as a calling card, too. Because then all of a sudden you're like, you hear the jingling of bells and they're like, oh, the dancers are here. Cool. Exactly. exactly. I missed them. We haven't seen them for three game sessions. You exactly. Know? And and again, that brings that back about. Yeah. Yeah. Every time. Uh, let me let me just quick say a quick thing too about uh, doing voices, mm-hmm. um, because this is a conversation I've I've had with Sean, um, and I think it's worth repeating for literally every single one of our listeners, uh, because there's uh, Sean uh, does a, a a British accent basically mm-hmm. for his for to to make his character feel noble and snooty mm-hmm. and arrogant. Um, not that all Brits are noble and snooty and arrogant, but he's that's what he's going for here. Mm-hmm. Um, aristocratic, aristocratic. Um, but, uh, we were driving home from game one time and he was like, he was like, I, I, feel, I feel weird doing the voice. Like, I feel like I'm annoying people. And so I want to say not only once again to Sean, but I want to say to literally every single one of our listeners, don't feel weird doing the voices. Mm-mm. Even if sure your, your voice may be bad. Mm-hmm. Okay. We're not all professional voice actors. Critical role did do. A little bit of damage collectively to the to, to the to the the, the the RPG community, just because we, it set a very high bar for what voices are supposed to be. Yeah. Um, when you've got Matthew Mercer doing all of them, mm-hmm. but do the bad voices. It's yeah. fine. A bad voice. First off, we're all just we're, we're playing D and D, man. It's it's we're playing make believe with mm-hmm. our friends. Mm-hmm. We're a bunch of adults playing make believe mm-hmm. with our friends. Yep, you know. Pretending to be elves and wizards and stuff like that. It's fine. It's already hokey. It's already hokey. Do the voice. Yeah. You know? Second off, even if it is a bad voice, mm-hmm. it's going to be memorable. Yes. Even if it's bad to the point where your friends laugh, chances are they're laughing with you. Because mm-hmm. they understand the ridiculousness of the situation. But it also makes the NPC notable. Yes. You know? Do the voices. It's fine. Give yourself permission to cut loose and be a little, be a little cringe, be a little embarrassing. Yeah. It's always cringe. It's always embarrassing. But you know what? It's also fun. But you can sometimes get lost in it, which is great. Yeah. When those moments happen, things can turn hilarious and wonderful. I distinctly remember running my 7C game and having one of the players during a... Uh, during a moment, literally roll a ridiculously high roll, a success uh, success state, and flipped instantaneously into character voice and went, you put the baby back. <laughs> and everybody at the table just laughed. But the point was is that he was addressing from his character what he had just figured out. That the other player had literally, it was a she, and uh, 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 S-I-D-H-E. S-I-D-H-E, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, it had stolen a baby and replaced, and basically brought it to them as a puppy. And he clearly put two and two together and got baby. And was trying to get them to put the baby back. Okay, so we're giving the baby back. I agree, I agree, I agree, I agree. <laughs> hey, the baby's part of the pack now. <laughs> <laughs> so, So there's your voice lines within that. The other part, which we, which I think is almost inevitable for making sure that you understand that this person is part of the world, is they're doing something. Right. It's only in digital games where there's literally someone just standing there waiting for someone to walk up to them to give them the quest. Uh, I do this. I do this with, with with Sean when we're just like sitting around home. Uh, I I I do my NPC voice for him. I'm like. Hello, greetings, welcome. Looking to trade? I have the finest wares. Yes. <laughs> and uh, you know, but but that's that's like the, the the type of NPCs, especially like if 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 we're video gamers, we're presented with all the time is NPCs standing around in their shop with nothing better to do than say, "Hello, welcome. Mm-hmm. Would you like to buy some potions?" Yeah. And then they cease to exist the moment the the, the PCs are gone, you know? Right, and it has no memory of them whatsoever. Um, so the biggest thing you can do to make your, make your PCs, or your NPCs lifelike is have them doing something. They mm-hmm. were doing something before the PCs walked in. Now, obviously, if with a shopkeeper, okay, they're going to be tending their shop, but are they just standing there at the counter? 
life lifelessly waiting for someone to come in or are they like cleaning up something that had spilled are they yelling at their partner who's in back doing some stock work or something like that and they're having an argument and they don't realize that the, the, the pcs came in like the count's off and they're arguing about the count yeah, like, why would you do that I tell you keep these ledgers in this weird arcane sc- oh i'm sorry i'm sorry uh i didn't realize we had customers how, how can i help you today exactly Boom, right there, instantly. Yeah. You've got personality. Now, you know? I'm going to take that one step further, is that when they're going to be notable, like in the case of our, our weaponsmith or armorsmith, when the, the PC wants to go there, there's something that they can be in that space as well. Mm-hmm. So maybe he is sharpening a blade. Maybe he is putting things away like he's got a, you know, he's got stacks of arrows that he just finished, mm-hmm. and he's now, he's putting them all up, and he's a little grumpy, but on his head is a Santa hat. It doesn't fit him very well. It looks really dingy, but he's wearing it. Yeah. Now, when your players come in to see him and see this, and he turns his head and gives you that rolled-eye look of, you're staring at the hat, aren't you? Don't ask about the hat. Right, but he doesn't have to say, don't ask about the hat. He's just giving you the look, don't ask about the hat. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that right there explains that there is something going on in the world. Like, the moment that you see that, you're like, Oh, it's the holiday festival. Instantly you know, first off, that it's setting a season. Mm-hmm. Okay. Two, he doesn't like the Santa hat. Three, that means he wouldn't have put it on by himself, so something is compelling him to wear the Santa hat. Mm-hmm. Who or what is it? Did he lose a bet? Is it his daughter trying yeah. to you know make him cheer up and be less bah humbug or something? You don't know. You don't even need to explain it. But the fact that you have made him put him in a Santa hat and made him look grumpy about it tells story. Mm-hmm. It puts him in a place and gives him a timeline of events. Things happened. And you've just happened to walk into a shop at this moment of time. Yeah. One of my favorite ones is the uh, the the doorbell ring. You know, the, the door, the bell over the door rings as you come in. The shop is empty. And then you see the the flustered, uh, slightly sweaty shopkeep come out of the back, tucking his shirt in and, and getting his vest back on square. And you go, oh, hello. <laughs> and you're like, what was just happening? You really don't know. Did he just wake up? He's having a little siesta. In the is back he having? Room. Did did he just take a nap and he's finally waking up? Is he even the owner? Like, is this just a mm-hmm. shop worker who was maybe slacking off a bit next door? I think that man was in bed. I'm not sure if he was sleeping or not, though. No. And that's the whole thing is is that you don't have to answer that question, but it makes it feel alive. Yeah, yeah. But if your players start asking questions, now you have a line to write. Mm-hmm. You have a side bit that you can keep going and keep them interested, intrigued in that character. And it shouldn't be difficult to come up with this stuff, too, if you if you kind of know what what your NPCs are about. You know, um, in my in my game, I have Lyra and Cassia, the lucky ladies. Yes. Uh, Lyra and Cassia for, are Fortunatus. Yes. Um, and they're sisters. And one of them, it's, it's basically Jay and Silent Bob in, in yep. female warrior form. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them's the mouthy one. One of them's the, the, the tall, stoic one. Yep. And uh, so it's constantly just Lyra running her mouth and Cassia just being there to kind of nodding along or adding mm-hmm. one or two word answers, you know. Um, and I had uh, one of my one of my PCs was just like, oh, yeah, I go, I go back to the Fighters Guild. Okay, I mean, I could say, like, cool, you're at the Fighters Guild, or I could set the scene a little bit for him. So mm-hmm. I had Lyra and Cassia there, and they're just standing in the stairwell arguing about how he got the dragon skull into the basement yes. in our last game session. I loved it. And they're like, they're like, no, 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 I understand you could just tilt it on its side and fit it through the door. How he got it through the door isn't the problem. How, it's it's not too wide. It's too long. How did he get it around the corner of the stairwell? It's a curled stairwell. Like there, there's just not enough distance here. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so that's what I'm confused about. There's no straight lines oh. to get to this door. Hi, Rigar. Yeah. Sorry, we didn't see you come in. You yeah. know. And that's that's how you set the scene. Yeah. You know, right. 
because it's just that's that's what they would be gossiping about. Right. And like clearly there was an argument that led up to this moment of them being on the stairs making this dis- making mm-hmm. this discussion. And I love it. But then you've, you so you you walk in on a scene like that and now suddenly it's not just like okay, you are in the fighters guild. There are NPCs here. What activity would you like to, in- to yeah. engage in? Now there's there's people there. They're doing something. There's a conversation that's caught your ear. Mm-hmm. It's not stopping you from doing anything, but it just kind of sets the tone for for it. You yep. know? The fact that when I went to go back to see the captain, the captain was meeting with somebody else. Yeah. Casually, but meeting with them. Mm-hmm. And it set a tone. Yeah. Absolutely. So. The, I think the last thing that we've got here before we get into some, uh, some teardown uh, is purpose. And the purpose is is not their purpose like job or goal, but we're talking about their narrative purpose. What are they doing in your story? What are they there to create in the story? What point are they making for you? Right. So, like, to give an example, mm-hmm. um, I have an NPC named Bashir mm-hmm. that um, literally the only purpose they serve is to remind you of your warlike nature. Yep, my character. Yep. Your your character has turned to a hospitaler, mm-hmm. but you grew up as a soldier, mm-hmm. and so you have warlike impulses. You have that old soldier in you that mm-hmm. solves things through violence, mm-hmm. and though you're trying to fight against that, this one NPC I literally just bring in because he calls you killer. Mm-hmm. And to remind you that those are things that you've done in the past. Yeah, that's definitely his his swag term specifically for me. And he's he's cordially fine with everyone else. Yeah. But he's even it... fine with you, technically. He technically, just has a nickname yeah. for you that you don't like. Yeah. Um, but that's his purpose. So, you know, it's it's basically just whenever I'm whenever we're discussing themes of Theodane, your character, mm-hmm. you know, it, about his internal struggle between um, being a man of the cloth and a man of the sword, mm-hmm. Bashir is always there to remind you that, yeah, no, you are a man of the sword, no matter how far you run from it. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. So what is an NPC's purpose? Yeah. Um, things you can look at is, like, mood, mm-hmm. theme, you know, what, the, what they're trying to bring forward. Uh, uh, was it... Um, uh, where did this list come from? Was it? Was this it... was Guy. Uh, Guy, of how the, to be uh, a great GM. How to be a great GM. Yes. Uh, um, this is his his list of seven. Is uh, either as a guide, uh, a plot advancement, mm-hmm. a rival, mm-hmm. a mentor, uh, a long term bond, mm-hmm. as a support character, or as comic reflection. Which Not basi- comic relief. Comic reflection. Comic reflection, which basically means to show the PCs the wrong way to do something. Yep. You yep. know, they are going to screw it up so that the PCs can look at them and go, oh, we shouldn't be doing that. Mm-hmm. We should be doing something else instead. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it's a matter of, like, you're coming into a town and you need someone to be caught doing something that, like, you know, maybe it's ch- maybe they don't allow chew- gum chewing here. Right. And you see him chewing gum like, like, like you know, a cow chewing a cud, and he immediately gets grabbed and flagged for, you know, and, and ticketed. And you're like, oh, oh, they're very serious here. Yeah. And I shouldn't be fooling around like that. There's great, a great way to show they, they are a lawful, you know, mm-hmm. or, uh, area, a, a, a oppressively lawful society. Yeah. Correct. So, yeah. Um, so we're, what we're going to do now is we're going to talk a little bit about some NPCs that we have come up with. Mm-hmm. In our various stories, and uh, talk a little bit about how how they came to be. Um, talk about their presentation, their personality, their quirks, and stuff like that, and what purpose they filled in the story. You reading Hulavu's comment? I, I am actually Hulavu in the live chat. He says, uh, uh, "I had a minor evil merchant who my party ran into in a restaurant. My party went from not caring about him to we are going to ruin his life with two sentences." I don't think your service warrants a tip. You see the server tear up and momentarily, but then regain her poker face. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he doesn't tip? No. No. We have to kill this guy. We have to ruin his life. This guy, uh, we're not going to kill him, but we're definitely going to ruin this guy's day. We are going to ruin this guy's day. Yeah. Yeah. And (laughs) it is... It is easy to do that. I yeah. have, I have, I have put them out there. I don't think your service warrants a tip is such a great line to come out of an NPC because it tells you everything you need to know about them. Yep, yep, yep. 
everything you need to know about them. So good. So yep, good. Yep. All right. So let's start doing some teardowns on these. We're going to focus on a couple of aspects to help. We're going to talk about their presentation, how mm-hmm. they present themselves, their personality, their quirks, and their purpose. Yes. Again, narrative purpose. So do you want to grab one or do you want me to – do you want to question me on one? Because I know you wrote down three here that you wanted for me to talk about and yeah, I have three for you. My, my F. Mary kill list. Uh, my, my bed, wed, behead list. <laughs> it was just funny. So so, so pick, pick what you want. All right. Tell me a little bit about Helmut Morgenstein. It's, it is Morgenstein. Uh, so. so this was from a 7th C game. Uh, the character I was playing uh, was uh, uh, Madeline Lescaux. She yes. was a um, – a gunsmith, a tinkerer, mm-hmm. and, and a crack shot, too. Yeah. Uh, effectively, a pretty, pretty princess uh, of her father's eye, mm-hmm. but at the same time, very intelligent and capable. Yes. Um, You had written down that you wanted a nemesis. Yes. And you started to come up with, like, this concept of, uh, like, a school rivalry, almost, or, or a handicraft rivalry. Mm-hmm. Um, And so, Helmet came out of that. Now... I wanted to present someone who was different than Madeline. I almost wanted to create like a mirrored foil. Sure. Um, so I I put down that it was a, that this is a professional rivalry that goes into indus, industrial espionage and perhaps a little political effort. Um, but the big thing is is that you had a name. Your father was an architect. I think is the way you had originally designed it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Helmet didn't. He had to be his name. He had to make everything. He was physically weak. He was a little scrawny. His hair was always scraggly. He almost was like a lab rat, literally. Yeah. Uh, in the way things. But he was intelligent, witty, arrogant, and specifically against women who were his equal or better. Mm-hmm. Like that really bothered him. And that pushed his greed and his ego. And that's how I wanted to present him. I always wanted him to feel like this, to anyone else, like this wiry rat who's just upset all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, that's where he should sit. Um, And that literally the closest thing that he's ever come to creating a prototype device that could meet a standard that even you, your character crafted, he he had critical flaws in it that you could easily point out. Mm -hmm. And yet... Uh, it, in a, a narcissistic statistic way, he sold you that device to another place under your name. Yes, yes. Just to get you like, oh, great, you thought it was fixed? There, I made your changes, and I sent it off. So this is crap? Fine. Signed, Madeline. Here you, you go. go. Yep. <laughs> and And now that's being used, well, not really, by someone else. But the whole point of it is, is that every incarnation of that was meant to be a rivalry. Mm-hmm. That he was always looking... Like he could, he was trying to find a way to be better Mm -hmm. because he wasn't as good to start with. What sort of, uh, what sort of quirks did you give him? So the wiry and rat was what lab rat was where I was going from. He was always going to be a little dirty. Mm -hmm. Like he was never going to like, even in a ballroom scene. He could never get himself to a clean enough state Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that people would recognize that he belonged there. He would either have a little bit of oil on him somewhere or underneath his nails that were obvious. His hair, he'd be pushing his hair back, which would be making it oily and a little wiry, like uncomfortable even in that situation. Yeah, a little, little grease monkey sort of. But yet yeah. arrogant mm-hmm. about it. Like he doesn't need to be there. This isn't his space. Right, right, right. right. Um, so personality-wise, like I said, driving that ego where he is he is good at what he does and without a doubt he against a normal average everyday person he 100 percent is he's smart he can craft his way out of most any situation uh yet when presented with an equal he will try to flare his own ego to get around it okay. and and be a, a bit greedy in doing so so aside from aside from the fact that uh, I I literally wrote down nemesis on my uh, on my character yes. sheet, yes. Um, is there is there any other purpose you would bring him in for? So, I think the the two big ones that I uh, that I was bringing him in for, uh, and Seven C kind of had an interesting quirk about it as a game system, and that was is that the only way that I could bring him in was either as a direct plot engine device mm-hmm. or 
whenever you wanted him there. You would spend drama to basically make the scene more dramatic by putting him in play. Right, right. So I would always have to come up with a reason why he was there, which uh. is which is definitely hard as a storyteller where you're just like, okay, I'm, I'm here's my story for the day, and you're like, oh, and by the way, Helmet's involved. And I'm like, okay, okay cool. so Gotta... I've got this other group that's a bunch of brigands on shore who are doing shady things. He's making the device for them. Oh, but okay. So in this case, we're going to show how dangerous this thing is, and that he's trapped as well. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to I'm going to give you a chance to see his humility. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That he is he is stuck where he is, and the thing he is making is too dangerous. Even he knows that, but now he's forced to do it. Yeah. So a lot of times, the presentation and purpose was to help drive the points of the story and use him as a guidance on that. I really liked that, too, because being that he was my nemesis, um, uh, the ways that you employed him in a lot of different situations, especially because I did just hand you a drama die and mm-hmm, be like, here, mm-hmm. st- stick him in your story somewhere, surprise. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it really, I, I really started to care mm-hmm. about him. Not like in a like, oh, I want to date him, you mm-hmm. know, sort of sort of way. But in in a like, I became invested in yeah. the character. You know, I didn't want to see him, I didn't want to see him hurt necessarily. You know, because he was my rival. Yeah. Like, what are these brigands doing to him? No, 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 no. He's my rival. Yeah. He fights me, not right. you. <laughs> right, right. And that's there's a thing to be said about the duel that is your duel, yeah. not someone else's. Yeah. Even if that duel isn't blades, it's uh-huh. the mind. You know. You, you you can't take what is mine from me, and this battle is mine. Right, right. You know, um, I I had an idea originally for him to become, as, as you started to, like, move into that framework, mm-hmm. I was going to get to a point where he was going to be like, I don't need your help. I don't need you. And kind of divorce himself of you. because yeah. and, 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 and push to a direction that probably is unhealthy. But at the same time, like, that right there saying he needs you more than anything. Mm-hmm. So how do, you, how do you handle that nemesis now? Yeah, there, there was there, – I, I, I had a bunch of ideas of how I, how I wanted to proceed with that, that whole messed up relationship. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, but still a relationship yeah. nonetheless. So – and that's the, – that is just an aspect. And again, I didn't have a lot of history on Element. I, I, I really didn't need much. I just needed his drive – and what that drive was going to feel like, regardless of where he was. Yep. As long as he stayed true to the purpose for which he was forged, mm-hmm. he, he, it could be he could be anywhere. He could yep. be doing anything. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So. All right. Grab one of mine. So when we first came into your world, mm-hmm. you were trying to set a a rhythm and a feel for for it, you know, and you you brought us a mayor yeah. of a small town, this uh, uh, Cormier. Right? Is is uh, Josette? Josette, Josette Corm- uh, Cormier, yeah. And again, she isn't a major character. In fact, we haven't talked about her since. Yeah, we haven't. But she was important for that adventure arc mm-hmm. of that small town. And she needed to be memorable. She needed to, re- she basically needed to display what that town was, why it was important. Yeah, yeah. And otherwise, it would have been like, what the hell do we care? Well, first off, she's the person hiring us. Literally, she's the quest giver, for lack of a better term. Yeah. And uh, But she needed to have weight because she was going to be around. It was more than just the, here's some money, go to this dungeon and get this thing done. She needed to be around to help craft the rest of the feel of the town. Correct, yeah. So so, so give me a bit more about her. Uh, all right, so I, I think... I can't really talk about Mayor Cormier without talking about the other NPCs that I brought in with her, mm-hmm. um, because I, I think Mayor Cormier was the was the the rock mm-hmm. amidst the kind of mess that she brought with you yes. brought with her, um, and and that's kind of I think why why she worked as an NPC for you guys is because you saw a bunch of disheveled villagers yeah. from a, from a fishing town up north. Um, come into the big city to hire some of these big city slicker warriors to solve their problem for them. Mm-hmm. And so you've got Mayor Cormier, who is this just a, um, she's a very strong individual. She had her crap together. She was well spoken. Mm-hmm. She was obviously educated and in control of the situation. 
um, and very pragmatic and kind of stern. Um, she had with her her trophy husband, Nathan, mm -hmm. um, and he was just kind of like shy and quiet and just kind of stood behind her and was just there to be supportive, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so solid role reversal from the traditional sense. I love that about exactly. it. Exactly. And it, it really did set the tone for your entire campaign's role reversals. Yes. I wanted I wanted Nathan to be her arm candy. And I loved it. Which is exactly how I lined I him up. I loved it. But she also brought, like, two, two guards with her, basically. Mm -hmm. And I think one of them was just, like sniffling and had a cold the whole time because it was dra it was it was spring so it was like raining and uh, kind of you know crappy Damp temperatures and, cold, and yeah. stuff like that um and another one had literally just fallen asleep in the chair yeah as soon as they got into the tent like they literally sat down and fell asleep um and so what you had what i what i actually did was i picked the seven dwarves mm -hmm. okay she was doc her husband was bashful and then you had sleepy mm -hmm. and sneezy i thought it was fantastic that she brought with her um, that's... Not obvious either. It, yeah. You had to point that out later, but it it made us all laugh and made it more memorable. Mm -hmm. So, um, but in contrast to these other people who are just trail worn and they 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 don't they don't know what to say, they don't know what to do. They're just there. They're com you can tell they're completely out of their element. Yep. They're just from some little fishing village, and they've come to this big city to have do to hire official fighters guild people yeah it's kind of a big deal you know you're not yeah. just fishing for any mercenaries here you guys are chartered by the empire mm -hmm. you know um and here's mayor Josette as this like key figure in the mid in the middle of it mm -hmm. of going okay look we are here for a very specific reason we've got a very specific problem we need you to solve this please mm -hmm. so that uh that was her uh and i mean as far as her purpose goes yeah she uh she was basically just there to be a uh uh, the face of the village mm -hmm. for you. Um, I like to give you one point of contact. Even though I brought a couple other NPCs with me, they were there to show contrast. They were never there to be interacted with in any sort of meaningful way. Yeah, Josette was always going to be the face you were going to be talking to. Yep, yep, yep. And I loved it. I I loved all of that. I loved the fact that it was her. Everything about her was obvious, mm -hmm. and it was easy to digest. There was never a point within the framework of why these other individuals there, it was all a pyramid to develop what the point was. Mm -hmm. And I, it was, it was wonderfully done. All right. Let's see here. Let me grab the next one here. And that is Bulgren. Christopher Bulgren. Christopher Bulgren. So Christopher Bulgren was, uh, was an NPC that I put into my D and D game. Mm -hmm. Um, D and D campaign, uh, because I needed someone to exploit and expose who you really, who your your characters were in this world, what your place was, mm -hmm. because you had been shifted in time. Yes, and it why you were there didn't make a lot of sense. Like two hundred and eighty year time skip, and we just get summoned. Mm -hmm. Yep, out, out of thin air, uh, effectively wished back into existence. Mm -hmm. Um, and why that was necessary or important, or why you. I think was the the better framework, and so I came up with this uh, this person who would expose that. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted him to be from a point of of authority where he was already a person in this world. He wasn't trying to make himself uh, raise himself up above anyone else. He he already was somebody. Mm -hmm. Um, he didn't need to do this, but what he was doing was literally taking this prophecy that was out there and exploiting it with his Proph own gang. The prophecy being our group would return someday. And so basically he made a fake one to profit and frame up. Yeah, because I mean, what, what are the chances these heroes are ever really going to show up? Yeah. So you might as well just, you know, do a little digging, make it sound authentic, and then start trading on their name. Yep, and, and it worked exceptionally well. Mm -hmm. He He had effectively recreated your group and was going around the countryside sometimes fixing problems but more of the time causing a problem to fix and grifting yeah exactly yeah um one of those characters uh happened to have a bigger impact than everyone else and that was a, a effectively a doppelganger of you yeah who was there uh, an accomplished wizard of sorts um who was effectively just crafting themselves in a specific direction mm -hmm. um but looked remarkably like you in enough ways that it could pull it off. Everyone else had quirks about them. 
Uh, but you had a style to your magic, you had a, a flair to it, and she was along for the ride, mm -hmm. effectively. Um, what I ended up doing with him was I wanted him to be ruthless in what he was doing. I wanted him to always feel like he needed to be in control mm -hmm. of the situation. And as the, as the situation grew out of his grasp, he would respond aggressively to get it back under control. And I wanted that to constantly be a theme for him of this, I'm losing control, I'm going to regain control because I'm the one to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I was always the one in control kind of a thing. Uh, and so actually I ended up having him kill off your car your, your doppelganger mm -hmm. uh, in a very brutal way because she slipped from him. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I had it just be the second time and the first time he told her exactly what was going to happen mm -hmm. if he, if he, if she ever did it again, uh, which was a threat, one that he would probably do something about. And um, you, it was a really great move on your part too, because, um, my character, albeit for a very short time though, had kind of bonded with the, uh, my, my not proper doppelganger, but you know, just a, a, a person who looked like me, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, I kind of bonded with her, and uh, so when she turned up dead, there was this moment of like, oh, I can't let that, I can't let that rest, mm -hmm. you know, I have to do right by her. Yeah. And even in, like, I, I think it was, she was already dead, but we, um, our cleric cast, uh, Speak with the Dead on her, mm -hmm. and she was like, tell Marco I'm sorry, or something like that. Yeah. And I'm like, who, who's Marco? Now I have to deliver a message. To, now I have to deliver a message to Marco. So, so, so keep jot that down. My purpose on Bulgren specifically mm -hmm. was to create a reason for your character to be there and drive that home. He started out with a purpose to just to expose the world and expose your characters and who they were. Mm -hmm. But the moment that you started to bond with that one character, and then you made a single comment to me. Mm -hmm. I, after a game, you, as a player, you came to me and you're basically like, uh, my character doesn't have a real reason to be here anymore. I'm no longer a guide. I don't even know this world. We're 280 years from what the reason why I was brought in in the first place. Right, right. What the hell am I doing in, here? In game terms, I was hired like two months earlier to guide them through the mountains, and that was it. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about the greater conspiracy. I didn't have deep, you know, psychological and emotional bonds with the rest of the party. I was a hireling. I was a glorified hireling. And you then were. all of a sudden we're 250 years in the future. In the and I'm desert. Like, in the desert. And everybody hates magic. And I'm like, I'm miserable. I've lost all everything I've ever loved. And I have no, no horse in this race. So I looked at it from the original fact that your character really didn't have family. Mm -hmm. Like, even in the world that you existed in. You really didn't have much. I lost my I lost my uh, my father very early on, and then my mother had essentially um, pawned me off on the witch on top of the mountain to teach me magic. Yeah, to possibly give you a better life. Yeah, and that witch really didn't like you either. Yeah, she did a good job teaching me magic, but no, she didn't like me. Right, right. So even if you were to go back to that world. There wasn't anything for you there anyways. Right. The things that you wanted, you couldn't have had. Right. So I gave you an opportunity to have them by having them already here. You gave me someone to protect. I did. And someone to hate. I did. And someone to protect them from. Yep. Yeah. Well, we'll start with a start with a with a note to deliver. Yeah. I gave you a reason to be there. We're running a little low on time here, so we're gonna think we're gonna do one more and then we'll get to the questions. I think that's a good idea. All right. So grab one of mine here. I. <sighs> Oh, I know. I know. It's a Sophie's choice. Which it is. It is. And one of them is definitely going to take a lot longer to explain than the other, which is that uh, Vedran is a great character that you just exposed yeah. uh, for who they really were. Um, and I, I want to do that. And I, But I think also Charlotte is a wonderful character because of who she, where she sits within the framework. She is the next step up from uh, the mayor and the fact that she became a reoccurring character. Mm -hmm. She didn't start that way. Uh, no, she was uh, so Charlotte was a, Charlotte was a bit of a footnote. Um, so Charlotte is the face 
uh, with, with a capital F mm-hmm. for the uh, for the Thieves Guild in, in Skingrad. Something you always love to say is, like, when you have a guild or some kind of cult, give them a face. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but but more specifically, like, in the, in the like, Thieves Guild mm-hmm. sort of mentality, you yep. know, of, like, think of leverage. Yes. You know, she's the face. Yep. She's the Sophie Devereaux yep. of, of the group, you know. Mm-hmm. She's the one with all the charm, the sexiness, and beguiles everybody and gets in places. She's the one you see. Mm-hmm. Not the one you don't see, you right? Know? Um, and so uh, when I started writing down the thieves guild uh, members, um, I didn't know if you guys were going to even get involved with them, but I figured, hey, they're in the city, mm-hmm. they're part of the story. It mm-hmm. wasn't necessary to resolve the plot to even know who the thieves guild was. Yep. But the very first thing you guys did was said, "We're going to go meet the thieves guild here." Mm-hmm. I was like, "All right, cool." So I could bring these guys in. So Charlotte had to become more than just the face. Mm-hmm. So I had to do some thinking on my feet about who and what Charlotte was. Mm-hmm. Um, so as the face of the Thieves Guild, um, which was the only note that I had on there, aside from her, she was a Breton, mm-hmm. um, is that she, there, there's several ways to be the face. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um in contrast to one of the other NPCs that you loved, the one we affectionately refer to as Ma Weasley, mm-hmm. um, Charlotte is the uh, the sexy mm-hmm. face, mm-hmm. right? She is shapely. She's basically a supermodel. Mm-hmm. Um, she dresses to show it off with, mm-hmm. like, thigh-high leather boots mm-hmm. and, you know, keeps her top unlaced and her bustier, you mm-hmm. know, and, and all that jazz. She always wants you looking. Mm-hmm. She always wants to draw your eye to her where it shouldn't be, mm-hmm. right? Cause not at her weapons, not at her eyes, what she's looking at. Right. If you're Because if you're staring at her assets, mm-hmm. you're not staring at possibly the other Thieves Guild member doing something right. or even what she's doing. Right. You know, right. you're not watching her double talk you. Right. You're not paying attention to the bad deal you just took. Exactly. Because all of these, these assets are just in your face. Mm-hmm. Um. Because of this, Charlotte knows she's she's in control, right? Mm-hmm. She's used to walking into a room, being the center of attention, and having a command of it because of that. Um, and so when she meets a character that doesn't immediately fall to her feminine wiles or reacts in a way that does not uh, that doesn't match up with what she's used to. Mm-hmm fawning all over her and you know misappropriating their 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 stuff in front of her um she doesn't quite know how to something she doesn't know how to deal with that because she is a very intelligent person but she sees that as more of a curiosity as an oddity Mm -hmm. of like oh you didn't fall for my feminine wiles interesting what are you on about you Mm -hmm. know um and now she wants to know more uh but aside from that though she's not like a bad person. She just has a skill. She knows how to market it, mm-hmm. you know, and that gets her money. Mm-hmm. So she's fine with that, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and that's, I mean, that's Charlotte in a nutshell. Yeah. The purpose she serves is just to be the face of the, uh, of, of the thieves guild, uh, to be the one you look at. And, um, I mean, aside from that, I didn't really need her to be much else. No, and in, and the weight that she carried within the story after that was only dependent upon scene to scene. Right. But she reacted in each one based on the previous. Right. And the right. actions of the group as as a whole. Right? Yes. So that's one of the things that was unique about her is that every time we met her and every time we did something in between, it added to the connection point of who she was mm-hmm. like the net. One of the next times we got to see her was literally her breaking into my room with two other thugs only to prove that they didn't know anything. They were looking for answers. Right. Right. And that set us in a different motion with her. It's like, but what did, but what did she do in that scene? She planted her shapely boot on the chest of uh, one of the other characters that was in the room. The dangerous you. mage in the room, The yeah. dangerous mage in the room, and just basically pointed a, pointed a, a rapier at him. You know, not, not in a, I'm going to stab you away, but, but in a, just, Don't move. Just, just stay in bed and everything will be fine sort of way. Yeah. And he did, and he's just like, oh, okay, I got a good view here, I'm fine. Yeah, it's like, this is, this is fine. Mm-hmm. Like, but 
then we're presented later with the with the response to the question which was opened, which I thought was great. You opened with a question of where is she? Mm -hmm. And the answer was you don't know. Oh, well, that answers my question, right? But the response to that was after we were able to find that person and recover them, it had impact. Yeah, yeah. So the person you rescued was kind of a friend of hers. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I thought it would be nice if she had kind of a softer side. Because, mm -hmm. um, yeah, okay, Thieves Guild, sure. But I kind of figured, you know, I, I, I wanted to show that at least this part of the Thieves Guild had a softer side to them. Um, mm hmm I needed to contrast the Thieves' Guild uh, that, that you guys had gotten to know with the villain of the story who was an ex-member of the Thieves' Guild. Mm -hmm. And she was kicked out because she was too brutal. Yes. And that was the big attribute I wanted you guys to understand about her, is that she does not F around. And mm -hmm. she will kill people if she needs to and will not think twice about it. But Charlotte was going to be the opposite of that. Like, there are different ways to handle these exactly. things. Exactly. And so I, I put Charlotte in direct opposition to that. And so um, I wanted to show that she had that softer side to her. Mm -hmm. So when this person went missing and then you guys subsequently rescued her... She was just, like, absolutely in your debt, and she was, like, uh, uh, almost like a caregiver of this person because – and she tried to pass it off as, as professional of, mm -hmm. like, look, I referred her to you, yeah. so my, my name is attached. I vouched for her, you know, kind of thing, you know, mm -hmm. so if anything happens to her, it's on me. Right. But you could really kind of tell that, like, no, also she cares about her. Yep, you know? exactly. So. Again, making them feel alive. Yeah. Giving exactly. them a quirk. Compassion. Compassion, yeah. I mean, compassion's a quirk. Especially for a rogue. Well, especially for a criminal. Yes. Someone someone you've come to know as a criminal, yes. Yep. yep. All right, we do have some excellent questions that I think are dead, deadly on topic. Oh, yeah, yeah. So let's start with, uh, let's see, which one do you want to start with here? Oh, let's I just think... start at the top. Grab okay. Nevim. Yeah. All right, so Nevim asks, how to keep an NPC consistent through time? The NPC behavior is coherent from the first to the last time they the PCs meet them. Uh, take notes on what you improv about a P, uh, about an NPC. Yep. Um, if you make something up on the fly, just jot down a little note of mm -hmm. like what voice you did for them or what little physical affectation you gave for them. Jot a little note about how that interaction went. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be long. Just like doesn't like Michael. Yeah. Pushed and, him. And oftentimes, especially if it's a, if you're doing affectations on the fly, make the note before you do it. Mm -hmm. That way you can keep looking at it to keep it up. Yeah. And you don't have to go far. That's I think that's the other thing about keeping NPCs consistent is don't monologue. Don't go far with the character. Mm -hmm. If you're going to say something, say nonsense for the most part, but add in the piece that's important as a small bit of it. Uh, worth noting, too, that um, keeping your NPCs consistent so that they're always acting the same is almost a little countercurrent to making them lifelike. Mm -hmm. your, if, if, if your NPCs are acted upon, especially if they're acted upon in a major way, they should change because of those actions. Charlotte, for instance, is cool, calm, prepared at all times. Yes. The next time we see her, she's breaking down the door in an inn room. To pin someone down and ask them a question. That is not her style. Mm -hmm. She she would send somebody a note. Technically, Aventus broke the door down, but... <laughs> she was still part of it. She yes. would normally not be there. Yes, exactly. That wouldn't have been her style in the least. Exactly. She's the face. She's not supposed to be holding a sword. Right. So sometimes just that that change in personality can be hard enough to recognize that something is important and that they are living part of the story. Exactly. If something is if something has changed, then it is amiss. It yes. is noteworthy. Or it is reactive. Mm -hmm. And that is where, you know, where, where NPCs can run in the room and say, "Why what did you do?" to the PCs and they're like, "What do you mean?" Like, "What do you mean? What do you mean?" Like you you can't be just sitting here drinking. What did you do last night? I'm in <laughs> I'm in the deepest crap ever, you know, yeah, that yeah. kind of a situation. Because they're trying to elicit something, but at the same time that person goes from being a normal person to being to have lost something. Mm -hmm. That makes them feel alive. Yep. Uh so next question is how do you make a uh make a foe NPC that the player would love to confront again and again? 
All right, so this is kind of a big answer. This is a, this can be a very long answer. Um, I have a few thoughts. All right, so what I did mm-hmm. was I spent an entire act of my game, <laughs> technically two, because I introduced him at the very beginning of the game. You did. Um, building him up as a fixture in their in their environment. Mm-hmm. Um, as a, uh, I made him a little off standish. Um, but I gave him some reasons for that. I, if the PCs chose to dig into it, mm-hmm. why his personality was the way that it was. So I didn't outright make him like a nice guy. He was unapproachable for a good while. Yeah. But then you guys did take the time to kind of go go to him and be like, hey, stop being such a dick. And he was like, oh, I, I guess I didn't realize I was, you know, I was being that way capital t telvani <laughs> right so uh and and you guys showed him a little you gave him a second chance you gave showed him a little compassion and he didn't know what to do with that so mm-hmm. you know uh, there was there was this big growing bond over time and stuff like that with you guys um now not everybody can dedicate that amount of time to then suddenly flipping the villain switch on the guy mm-hmm. but the idea that your villain is just a person mm-hmm. okay and that that person doesn't necessarily want the PCs dead, mm-hmm. doesn't necessarily have a vendetta, doesn't necessarily hate them. He may even respect what the PCs are doing, mm-hmm. trying to stop him. Like, that's that's fine, you know? He can even revere them a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what you're looking for, is... Showing that sort of respect, showing that it's not just all about attempts on the the hero's lives, you know, give him a bit of a personality, give him some some good quirks, really lean into making them a person that exists in your environment, and I think your PCs are going to love interacting with him. Yeah, I, I I I'll give a couple of good examples of things that uh, that I think work, especially if you're dealing with an NPC villain that is a villain, a capital V villain, mm-hmm. right? Um. Number one, uh, in uh, uh, what was it the the uh, the cartoon spell book guy? I'm trying to think of his name right now. Uh, he does the YouTube channel. Oh, um, uh, Z Bashaw. Z Bashaw. Uh, he had a really great in one of his videos about a, a kukri, the bird, the bird uh, humanoids who can only repeat phrases they don't have their oh, own language uh uh yeah not a cook k- k- a cookery is a brush knife um uh, a bush knife uh, uh a k- kenku kenku yes um but the character was this uh was basically a uh a, a bandit of sorts mm-hmm. who was always just outside of their grip he would get himself into situations and somehow get out of them in a miraculous way and draw them to another adventure and the idea is is that he's he's the thing that they're trying to get their hands on, but for some strange reason, he's just annoying enough that he keeps slipping the coil. Yep, yep. Just a little bit each time. He's injured, he's he's not doing well, but somehow he slips away. But he uses their own phrases against them all the time. Because he's repeating their words. Best part of Kenku. Yeah. And I thought that was a great way of doing it, is when you can repeat. I think the the concept of a bandit lord uh, kind of t- draws us back to westerns, where you've got these swarthy people who look at the law with the eye of either I own you, or they look at it with the concept of you can't catch me. Mm-hmm. I've done nothing wrong. Right, the laws on my side. Right, yeah, and those kinds of characters, you, you, your character, your players will just itch to go after. Yeah, because they're just the other side of wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, and they're gonna wanna, they're gonna wanna break the law to get that person, and that person knows it. Yeah, they're waiting for them, like you. You want to cross the line. You want to become the thing you think I am. Right, right, right. But but oh, but you're the good guy. But so you're you the can. You wear the white hat and you do the right thing. Because yep. the moment you step over that line, you're like my brother, who you want to get a piece of, right? Yep. Because he's a bandit, right? And that's that's the thing. Those types of situations where you can literally just turn a mirror to the players and put them just the side of right. Mm-hmm. That's 
that is the one, the the times when the capital V villains come out. That's when you've really owned the situation. And the art of that is knowing that they aren't doing anything wrong yeah. within the framework of things. And for the players to do anything to them would be wrong, whether it's improper, disrespectful, or just it, or, or completely illegal and villainous to get that person. Because, again, they've done nothing wrong. Mm-hmm. They may be a jerk, but they've done nothing wrong. My my only other piece of advice here is you you see this uh, uh, my two my two of my favorite villains, Gul Dukat mm-hmm. from uh, from Star Trek Deep Space Nine, mm-hmm. and uh, Boyd Crowder from yep. Justified. Yep. you see this one all the time. Is don't always put your villain in direct opposition to your players. Yeah, bring him in as a side character. Mm-hmm. To do something completely unrelated to thwarting the heroes. Put them in there to just pick up something from wherever it is that the heroes are. Yeah. Oh, we're just running an errand right now. Yeah. You know? <laughs> or or have them solving some other ulterior problem that just puts them in the same place, you know? Yeah. And but you see this happen all the time where like the heroes are are, are forced to just talk to Gul Dukat. You yeah. know, like, oh, I am here as a as a, an envoy of the Cardassian Union. You know, I'm here on official business. And you're like, cool. So you're the ambassador I have to I have to put up with for the next three days. You know? Yeah. Awesome. You're going to be you're, annoying you're, as hell. You're not here to start crap. I'm not worried about you being the villain. You're not going to blow the station up or kill anybody. But you're going to be annoying the entire time. But you're here, and I have to deal with you. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. And that's what's going to allow you to build personality with them. If if every one of your encounters is, I try to kill you or you try to kill me, yeah. then it just becomes an arms race. And it's just yep. like, you know what, we should just do away with this dude and be done with him. Yeah. Because eventually he's going to try to kill us. Yeah. If you stick them in the same situation, just be like, I don't know, I don't want to be here either, but I've got a job to do. Mm-hmm. Okay, now you've got three days where you can just, you just have to deal with that person, and they, you can learn their personality, you can learn their quirks. Mm-hmm. You get to know them as a person, and then they want to show up more and more. Yeah. Yep, exactly. All right, sci-fi tough guy. How do you keep an NPC lifelike when they were created on the spot by the player's action in the game? Okay, so this is one of the best places to think about purpose. Mm -hmm. Okay, why were they created on the fly? Mm -hmm. Okay, for what purpose were they created? Mm -hmm. Okay, did you need, uh, so by by player actions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... You rescued a child from a burning building or something like that. Okay, now that child needs a grateful mother to run up and go, oh, you saved my child! And now the player wants to know about this mother. Mm-hmm. Okay, now you've got to invent this NPC on the fly. All right, mm-hmm. what purpose does this grateful mother show? Mm-hmm. Well, this is a physical manifestation of, of, of a quest reward, essentially. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is the fame, the good reputation, the reward of having done a good deed. Okay, so what sort of things then can you bake into that NPC? Yeah. You know, think about it from that point right there. Okay, what am I trying to accomplish with this NPC? Do I just want to, is she just going to be a short-term thing where I'm just trying to make the player feel good about having done something nice? Mm-hmm. Well, then she 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 brims with gratitude and she swears she's going to name her, you know what, she's, she's pregnant and she's going to name that child after you now. Yeah. She wants to know what your name is. Yeah. And then that night at the pub, they're all cheering your name and having a toast in your name. Yep. You know, cool. Um, but that's that's my advice. Think about what the purpose is, and then build upon that. Build attributes that will support that purpose. Yeah. For for me, I think the 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 short term in the life likeness is if you're building something on the spot, the the first thing is. Think about where they sit in status. Give them a name based upon that. Give them an instantaneous quirk. And because it is player created by actions, mimic the action. Like, define the action. Uh, In your case, a a little girl is saved. Okay. 
why was that little girl needing to be saved? Was her mother sick? Was she overworked? Was she somewhere else? Was she was she out? Cat saved her face. You know what? What is she blind? Mm-hmm. Maybe she didn't know her daughter had left. Right? Any number of reasons but you can come up with on the fly for why that child wasn't able to be looked after. Right? And that right there frames up all kinds of situations that you can then present for plot. Plot exposition to make them a guide. Maybe they're leading them to the next part of the story. Right? Mm-hmm. You know, and especially if it's a blind person. I love when blind people can lead people to another part of the story. Like, yeah. it's the Geordie LaForge, you know, yeah, 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 of yeah. things. Is that that person has knowledge, has access, maybe has a ward who watches over them and the child mm-hmm. and felt horrible that the situation happened. You know, that person now owes you. So this is back to the reward aspect. Yep. Like, there may not be money enough to go around, but I can tell you about something you can find. Mm-hmm. I have information, mm-hmm. right? And, you know, that that then allows you to expand the story beyond that person. But having those first frameworks allow you to already be in the mindset when they walk in the door that this blind, homely woman who could, who is devastated and now happy that her child is back and, and is clutching her close to you and re- grasping for you because now instead of being okay with her surroundings, sh- she's lost again in a space, in a room, looking for who was the savior mm-hmm. to try and find. And that right there makes it a memorable moment. Yeah. When you're literally sitting at the table with your eyes closed, reaching out, you know, your hand clutched to your chest as if you're holding the child to you and you're looking for that player. Mm-hmm. That's a moment. Yeah. That you've just created that is lifelike. Yep. So. Uh, okay, so Philly Fan asks, any advice on playing an NPC that is way smarter than you are, especially one with a propensity for complex wheels within wheels types of plans? Okay. I'm going to start this one off by saying don't do wheels and wheels. You okay. don't need to do that for an NPC who is smarter than you. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the point of any good... Uh, NPC who is intelligent, markably intelligent, is that they speak in short phrases and they release only what is necessary. Oftentimes, uh, it's all about how many notes they've taken about the situation. Um, they they will implore that they know more, but will give very little informa- legitimate information. Right. The Sherlock Holmesian or or in this case, if you've got an NPC who is your uh, who is a foil to the group, they need to they need to seem on the ball about everything. Now, the hardest part about that is, is that, you know, everything is the storyteller. Right. You already have all the information. So exposing that as an NPC can often feel very daunting. Because how much do you release? How much do you talk about? How do you say it? And I will say this. Don't. You don't have to be smart. You can say that they open up with the phrase, well, it was all too easy to put the pieces together. And then just say they go on explaining the elaborate detail of notes that they had, reflecting on the past three days, noting some of your weaknesses, some of the strengths, how they could easily exploit them, all while remaining calm, collected, and condescending. Mm -hmm. And right there, you framed their intellect without having to be that intellect. Because you're explaining to the players, they know everything. They have all the information without having to expound it, which your players aren't going to remember anyways. What they're looking for is what is memorable about this moment. And realistically, what you need is an opening and a closing. And those statements should just be weighted. The I know everything, and that is why you're here. Because I planned this. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Like, they should always feel like they know what's, what's the right way to go. I can expand upon that. By all means. Uh, so... For me, uh, I think the biggest thing you can the, the <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna phrase this very poorly and then I'm going to explain. The best thing you can do is metagame. 
I mean, that's true. Um, so uh, take a look at Blades in the Dark uh, with the flashback mechanic, okay? Yep. It allows players to retroactively have planned for something. Mm-hmm. You know, they come up with something that would react in the fl- on the fly to this because they're professionals. Mm-hmm. They would have planned for things like this. That works for your villain, too. Without a doubt. Okay. And so when I say metagame it a little bit, what I mean is... Your players come up with something clever, maybe something a little off the wall, okay? Something a little less, a little less blatant than just kick down the door and, and, and fight them, you know? Mm -hmm. They think they're clever Mm -hmm. by having done this. Now, don't do this all the time, or you will tell your, you will teach your players not to think outside the box. Or just think out loud. Right, exactly, or they'll start hiding things from you. Okay, but within reason... Occasionally, what you can do is you can go, yeah, my villain would have seen that coming, Mm -hmm. and think of a reasonable way in which he would have already prepared to counter that thing, you Mm -hmm. know? So, okay, well, we're not going to go through the front. We're going to sneak in through these little ventilation shafts. Cool. They're lined with traps because he knows they're there. Or there's only one way to get out of them. Right. And he knows exactly where that point is. It, it, yeah, exactly. And so that's where the trap is. You come mm-hmm. out of the ventilation right into him is, is waiting. And you have space. fallen into my trap. Exactly. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly, that kind of a thing, though. yeah. Yeah. You know, so, like I said, don't do it all the time, or you will teach your players not to try to come up with clever, clever plans. Mm-hmm. But if you have someone who is truly um, intelligent like this, they will think of things, even if you don't. Your NP, your NPC can legi- can legitimately think. Okay, I need to fortify my place in X, Y, and Z way because I'm intelligent enough to know where my own weaknesses are and cover for them. So if your players try to exploit one of those weaknesses, they can be ready for it. Yeah, I, I still like the ultimate. Of course not. I did it 45 minutes ago. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Then you're like, oh. But that does make a lot more sense. Do you think there would be any chance I would explain my master stroke to you if there were any chance that you could, or that I would explain my master stroke to you if there were any chance you could affect its outcome? I did it 35 minutes minutes ago. ago. Beautiful line. Yeah. Yeah. And then immediately shows what he had done. Yes. That the effects are already occurring, which devastates everyone. But the whole idea is, is that you're presenting like that. That's an ultimate hard move kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. Right. And now you're you're dealing with the the actual boss fight is is psychological within the players themselves of like, what do we do now? Right. Like, oh, God, this guy sees everything, you know, but well, not even so much that is like he was the villain we knew was going to do this. Now he's done it. But we can't. So we can't stop it. Yeah. So now we now we have to deal with the, with the fallout. No, right. But how do we deal with him? Right. <laughs> what do you do with the dude who already did it? Right. You know. Right. Take me to jail. Do you exact punishment? I mean, yeah. Maybe it's already he, happened. Maybe he even just surrenders himself. You yeah. Know? It's already over. Yeah. yeah. I I loved that about the Joker. Like, oh, I've already done all the things. What are you gonna do? Punch me again? Y- yeah. Yeah. yeah wait, exactly. Did, did, was, was that one for your dad? Like. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and th- that is a villain. That is a hardcore villain who's intelligent. It's it. like, it's like I already did the bad thing. Mm-hmm. You can't stop me. So what are you going to do now? Punch me harder? Yeah, only thing left for you is vengeance. Yeah. So, yeah. oh, that makes you that makes you villainous. Yep. Right? Yep. So. Oh, I, love, right, gotta, I love it. We got to wrap this thing up. We're running, yes, we're running we do. super long here. So right. next week's topic, it's going to be the second Wednesday of the month. So we're going to be doing a system spot. Let's Our start. last one of the year. Last week, uh, last month and one of the year, we were doing uh, Star Trek Adventures by yes. Modiphius. Yes. Um, so it uses the 2D20 system similar to uh, to Dune that we did uh, uh, yeah. so last year, I want to say. Sounds about right. Oh, uh, God, time is... Time is irrelevant. Time is weird soup. We've done it. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're going to be talking about Star Trek Adventures. Star Trek something that's a, very, a property very near and dear to my heart. Um, and I, I picked the book up, actually, because I wanted to run it. Did you uh, did you see my note that I put in there where we're gonna boldly go where a few storytellers have gone before? Oh god! I know I'm terrible. I'm terrible. All right. Well, on that note, you can find us on Twitter at st underscore conclave and Instagram at st underscore conclave. Listen to us live every Wednesday night, at 7 p.m. Eastern time on mixlr.com slash storyteller dash conclave, and join us up on our Discord. Uh, we got a couple new, well, a couple new members recently. We do. Um, great to see you guys. Uh, join the join the conversation. Shoot us some questions. We'll answer them here on the air. Uh, and you can find that link on 
on our Twitter as well as our website, StorytellerConclave.com. We'd like to thank our Patreon members who support us every single month, especially our name members, Knox in the Box, Subject, The Arcane Asylum, Veteran, Hulu, Sam, Sean, and Sparkle Motion. We appreciate your support. Our pre-show music is by Arcane Anthems. You can find them at Patreon.com slash Arcane Anthems or on Google, uh, on YouTube, I would say, and Instagram. Uh, at Arcane Anthems. Our intro music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. You can find that at geefrog.bandcamp.com or on YouTube. Our outro music is our Only Our Footprints in the Sand by Meteor Machine. You can find them at freemusicarchive.org. And a big shout as always to our families, Vicky and Sean. Thank you so much for Thank loving you. and supporting us. All of our friends who sat at our tables over these years who give these great stories to share with you and you, every single one of our listeners. We love you guys so much. Love you guys. Good night. Good night.